Left in Kentucky, the podcast of Indivisible Northern Kentucky, District 4. And welcome to our latest episode of Left in Kentucky. And you are here with yours truly, Roberto Enriquez. Hi, I'm Amy Ferguson. Hello, Ann Dickerson here. And we've got a lot going on this week, so let's uh, jump right into it. Our Cow Patty Awards, um, you know, this being our third episode, this is a long-standing tradition and one that we're very proud of. Uh, so today, why don't we start off with Amy? What Hello. do you have for us? I chose Mr. Wayne Lewis, Charter School Champion and Kentucky Commissioner of Education. Congratulations, Wayne. You win the cow patty from me this oh. week for requesting the list of teachers that called in to Frankfurt. Just what do you think you're going to be doing with those uh, names, Mr. Lewis? We all want to know what your plan is. Yep. Excellent. You know, it's their sick days. They can use them how they want. Correct. That was an excellent one. Do you want me to go next, Anne, or do you want to go next? Up to you. I'll go next, since since Anne has a big surprise for us on her <laughs> announcement. So we'll save that. Um, so my cow patty goes to Mike Pompeo with the uh, with the State Department for a number of reasons, but most notably was his decision to have a press briefing about uh, world religious freedom and only inviting faith-based media to the press briefing and refusing to release any documentation or transcript of what happens at this meeting. Pretty sure that that's a violation of the law. I think they have to be open, uh, but I'm sure we'll hear more about that. So Mike Pompeo gets my cow patty award that's a stinky patty <laughs> you went federal on us Ooh, yep. ah. well i'm gonna take us back to the state level um i actually have two cow patty awards they were so significant that i just couldn't choose between the two of them and i have a shocking word of praise um my first cow patty award obviously goes to damon thayer i wonder oh. if we're ever going to have a week where he's not included in our cow patty awards for his um, first temper tantrum over Senate Bill 34, which was the basically anti-Grimes bill uh, that couldn't make it out of Senate committee. So what did he do? He turned around and aided it as an amendment to House Bill 114, and it passed, which is absolutely the most pathetic thing ever. The it sec- stinks. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> the second one is going to go out to... All of the House GOP members who voted on the last day for the net metering bill without the amendment that was added to make it a better bill. The way that that bill was pushed through at the end of the night, it was after 11 o'clock, was absolutely one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen. They had agreements between parties, you know, bipartisan agreements that the House would not pass this bill if it didn't include the amendment. And the GOP members turned around and basically stabbed every one of the people on the other side in the back and decided, you know, we don't need you. So we're going to take our super majority and do what we want. And in the process, did a great deal of damage to the solar industry in a state that so desperately needs it. So that's that's a massive one. But I do that's a whole field of patties. That is a whole field yeah. of patties. But I do have to give a word of praise to Jeff Hoover. I just really yes, I I do. Um, Say more about this. Do do we ever agree on policy? Probably not. You know. Um, did he do some really just down and dirty things last session? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. But I have to give credit where credit is due, especially when it's in such a public fashion. Because when it was his time to speak on the floor in regards to Damon Thayer's move with attaching his uh, Sen- uh, Senate Bill 34 as a whole to the House bill... You know, he went off on the floor and was like, the House is not here to carry the Senate's water. 
and, you know, just went on and on about what a dirty, shady deal it was that he couldn't get it out of committee in the Senate. So they're going to turn around and pass it in the House. And I have to give props for that. I mean, he was at least willing to stand up and say that. And if there's one thing you can say about Jeff Hoover, it's that you'll never accuse him of carrying Matt Bevin's water like you can, you know, Damon Thayer and the others. Uh, right. He has been a big, outspoken Republican when it comes to that, that their job is not to serve the governor's pleasures. So I have to, I'm sorry, I just, I have to give him mad props for that. I'm always going to give props where props are due. Excellent. If you have somebody that you think should be awarded a cow patty, feel free to leave that in the comments for the podcast uh, there are there is a way that you can go back where you download your podcast from and leave us comments and we would love to see that absolutely or you can also email us yes inkyd4 at gmail.com that address again inkyd4 <laughs> At gmail.com. <laughs> excellent, excellent. No fair smiling and laughing at me when I'm talking. <laughs> and now we have with us uh, Chris Toby, who is the author of Kentucky Fried Pensions. Uh, he also served as trustee and investment committee member for the Kentucky Retirement Systems and is currently a candidate for state auditor. Welcome with us. Uh, welcome today, Chris. Welcome, Chris. All right, thank you. Uh, so why don't you take a little bit to tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Um, I have, you know, 30 years' experience in the financial sector, uh, mostly with banks and um, insurance companies, also doing consulting to public pensions around the country. Uh, but again, about 20, 22 years ago, I was hired by Kentucky State Auditor Ed Hatchett to be a part of his senior staff and to specifically look into pensions. I spent three years with him. Uh, then and uh, wrote a 40-page report on both pension systems back in the late 90s. And I've been kind of the uh, an expert on Kentucky pensions ever since, even though I went back out in, into the private sector. So I, I like to say I'm in my 22nd consecutive year of being told I've exaggerated the pension crisis. <laughs> Excellent. So uh, speaking of the pension crisis, uh, it's been pretty eventful the past two uh, sessions in Frankfurt. This week, uh, we saw some uh, really disturbing activity. Most notably, I think, uh, when we start with uh, Senate Bill 49, I believe it was. Yeah, ha House Bill 49. That's what it was. And uh, that, that is the one that um, is kind of snuck through by, by Jerry Miller, the guy who snuck, tried to sneak through the sewer bill. Probably snuck through something here that's much more damaging in a lot of ways because the sewer bill can be fought in court. This one al allows back a lot of these offshore hedge funds and private equity funds that we had been tr starting to get rid of under the old Senate Bill 2, but this reverses that and allows them back into our pensions. Wow. Really, you know, I think this is a general problem we're seeing, right, with the with the transparency and the lack of transparency, and instead of trying to say, okay, let's deal with this above board so that everybody knows what's going on, um, trying to do things behind the scenes and and where people don't can't tell what exactly is happening. Yeah, and this bill is, is so much. It's, the bill itself, House Bill 489, was passed in a few days on a consent calendar, snuck through, and then snuck through the Senate as well, and it was disguised and, and really lied about in the description of the bill and said it was improving uh, accountability and transparency when, in fact, it was making it much, much worse. The bill technically just strikes out the words of a, Standard, what I call the CFA Asset Manager Code of Conduct, which was a transparency standard for the money managers in the pensions that made them fully disclose their fees and their performance. And they took that standard out. Instead, they replaced it with a SEC standard, but it was a standard they were already uh, subject to anyhow. So it was a bait and switch in a lot of ways, and, and they ended up and dollars being one of the most corrupt bills in Kentucky history. The reason why is because we're paying out over $400 million a year in these secret no-bid contracts to Wall Street from our two pension plans. And this allows the most expensive high-fee plans to, to still continue for them to use these type of um, 
plans. I, I don't understand how we can have no-bid contracts. I mean, my understanding was always that when the government engages with something, they're supposed to take bids and then select based on those bids. How do we get around that? Well, this started, I don't know, around maybe uh, eight or nine years ago, and uh, a lot with these kind of what we call private equity uh, uh, investments. A lot of people know private equity from Mitt Romney, are now Will Barras, who is one of the Trump's aides, are, are private equity billionaires. And these private equity partnerships were kind of brought in series, and you had, they kind of, you were given a time to go in, and they had said that, oh, we can't, we're, um, you can't bid on these things because it's a great opportunity to get in. You're lucky to get in a lot of these really secret great investments. So if you have to ask, for competitive bidding, then you can't get in these great investments. That's the argument that Madoff used in hedge funds. And they used that argument and threw a lot of money around in state legislators and were able to exempt themselves from competitive bidding laws all across the country. I see. I understand. Okay. Um, so what other bills uh, have we seen in this session that are of concern? Well, I mean, uh, we had a bill that went in the opposite direction of House Bill 49, House Bill 126, that actually would have made it a Class D felony to go into these types of investments. But of course, that bill was never even allowed to be heard uh, in committee. Right. And so, uh, it, it, but it was out there for everyone to see, but then House Bill 49 was snuck in at the last minute that went in the entire opposite direction. Okay. The other bill that is a that, well, this is that was an investment related bill, uh, House Bill three fifty eight uh, is a uh, raid a billion dollars from our KERS, the worst funded plan in the U S. But this is really caused by Bevin's unfunded mandates to universities uh, and uh, some of these nonprofit mental health agencies. A lot of these attention crises. Brevin claims to have fully funded the pension, but he really hasn't. He's had played a lot of shifting games where he shifted costs onto the budgets of like uh, county health departments, who many are now going bankrupt. Universities. Uh, he has done a lot of the things that so-called appear to be fixing the pension are really money shifts. And the and the rating agencies, S and P and Moody's, who rate the company's credit see through Bevin's games, and they've downgraded the state twice since he's uh, come to office, and may downgrade him again if this House Bill 358 goes through. It's supposed to have a, a another settlement between the Senate and the House, and it, it may even be vetoed by the governor, not because he wants to um, uh, not help uh, the university, just because he may be afraid of another uh, rating downgrade while he's running for re-election. Right. So I'm not sure that people really understand what is the impact of the rating downgrade. So how does that affect the state of Kentucky if our rating gets downgraded for a third time now? If it gets rated, it, it just increases the cost of all borrowings. Uh, so when you buy, when you issue bonds for um, uh, for highways or bridges or or even when school districts issue bonds to build new schools. The state rating affects all the underlying entities as well. And so the bond rating does have an effect on the cost of borrowing, and that could be in the, in the, you know, in the hundred, hundreds or tens of millions of dollars. The other effect it has is on economic development. Uh, other companies moving into Kentucky generally don't like to move into a state that has a bad credit rating. The only state with the worst credit rating in Kentucky is Illinois, and that has caused a lot of people... Uh, states like Indiana use that their superior credit rating to take businesses away from Illinois and Kentucky. Got it. All right. So, um, so I guess what can what should we be doing in Kentucky to kind of get ourselves out of the situation we're in with the pensions? Well, the main problem is we've been running a, a, a billion dollar deficit for the last ten years. The billion was a B. So what they've done is they basically underfunded the pensions, used the pensions to borrow from them like a credit card. We bail, they, The first thing, we have to come up with enough revenue to really balance our budget. Uh, the games that Governor Bevin have played is like, well, he makes people increase their pension payments, so then they have to cut 
payroll, and then the pay, then you have less people, less uh, current employees supporting retirees. It puts you in this uh, circle that's just keeping down, uh, that keeps us uh, going down the drain. So the real issue is probably is going to be to get more revenue, so that when they make your pension payments, you're also you're doing it in a healthy way. Not when you're having to fire, uh, you know, police and firemen and, and other people as you're doing it. Uh, so it's it really will take a revenue enhancement, which nobody wants or likes, uh, to to really solve it and to really pay the full arc. And then the second thing, which is the recommendation in my books, would be total transparency uh, in investments and in, in uh, benefits and everything else. And then the third is almost is to separate the CERS, the city and county part of the pension, away from KRS to bring more transparency and to give cities, counties, and school districts back control of their budgets. And that's an issue that uh, that's really uh, relevant to a lot of you know cities and counties and school districts across the state. The Governor Bevin has used the pension as a weapon to basically hurt them um, and uh, for and destroy their budgets. Uh, these un, these unfunded mandates uh, for CERS, the part of the retirement system, it's not even a state liability. It's a city and county liability. But he has control of the KRS board and has used that to destroy budgets uh, in cities, counties, and school districts. Right. And, um, you know, I think this is probably a good time also to kind of talk about, um, you know, talk about pensions and and what the pension is and and you know as one of the things you mentioned was the governor talks about having um, people pay more into the pension and as we look historically in the state um, everybody the people the the people working in these systems they've paid in what they've supposed what they're supposed to have paid in for their parts of the pensions right Correct. And remember, pinch, people earn their pension every day like they earn their salary. You earn a little piece of it every day. And it's not something, it's not some extra, it's not something you just take away. The governor, had, you know, a lot of misinformation from him on this. And even if the, even if our pension, uh, the balance, because of our mismanagement goes to zero, we still owe the pensioners the pension. Uh, the state, the state does, or in the case of the CRS, the cities and counties do. So there's just a lot of just a lot of spin and misinformation on what pensions are, what they do. Uh, they're part of your total compensation package, and many people, teachers, got into it with the with the fact that their total compensation may be 20 percent is pension, 80 percent salary. Where in the private sector, your total compensation may be only 10 percent pension or 5 percent pension and 95 percent salary. So you can't change the game after you've already kind of that's kind of the, the setting that you go into. And when you take away someone's pension, you're basically doing the same thing as cutting their salary. So many of these, many of these, uh, most of this legislation, like taking teachers and putting them in a 401k, is really like giving a starting teacher a pay cut from 29000 to 25000 It's the same equivalent. And no one wants, and it really doesn't do anything to, help the pension. So a lot of this is bait and switch. Almost all of the legislation that we've seen have been things that really don't help the pension liability. They just punish new uh, new teachers or in the case of a, in 2013 new firemen and policemen are punished because they do not get uh, a, a good pension uh, going forward as well. So it's basically the equivalent of a pay cut from maybe I don't know what is 30000 to 25000 so it's not a surprise that we have a harder time getting police and firemen today because we basically have cut their compensation. All righty. Uh, so we're almost at the end of the uh, legislation, uh, this legislative session. There's, uh, I think we're down to the one day for veto overrides right after we're on the veto break now. Yeah, that's where we are. Yeah. Correct. Um, so I guess what should what should people be looking out for in the in this veto period and then the final day? Uh, do we suspect any more uh, surprise last minute things coming from the legislature? Uh, just what should we kind of be aware of in this last uh, last few days? I, you know, I, I, you know, Chris, you're not sure. I don't know. I, you can't trust anything out of this legislature. So They'll sneak it in. One thing that I would expect, the possible thing, is that House Bill 358 
the one that gives the universities, uh, it pulls them out of the KERS pension and also hurts the funding of the pension, the governor could veto that just because he doesn't want another bond downgrade. Right. Um, even though it's Republican legislation, he may end up vetoing that thing that, because it could cause a, a bond downgrade. So that's one that what, is a possibility that's out there. All righty. Great. Uh, well, we're just about the end of our time here. Um, is there, uh, I guess, if anybody's interested in more information about the Kentucky pensions or about uh, you and what you're doing and you're involved with, is there someplace they can get more information? Yeah, my, my website is christoby.com. And, of course, my Kentucky Pride Pensions, you can look up on Amazon as well. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping to be traveling the state, talking a lot about pensions to everybody, but again, running for auditor as well. And on some other issues, we have the Yum Center, uh, stadium over cost uh, here, fish and wildlife. There are a lot of other areas the auditor um, will, you know, I will look into if I'm elected as well. But the pensions will be the top priority uh, because that's where the that's where the money is. That's where the corruption is. Excellent. Well, we really appreciate you taking time to be with us today, and uh, we uh, wish you much luck in in your campaign as you go forward. And uh, thank you so again. much, Chris. All right, thank you all for having me. So now we've entered the veto period in the state legislature, where uh, the governor has a chance to review everything that's been passed and decide if he's going to sign it or veto it. And we are going to do that ourselves by reviewing what's happened in this legislative session. So, Anne, did, did anything happen in this legislative session? Are there it's any bills quiet. to talk about? Lord have mercy, help us all. Um, you know, I, I've taken to calling the Kentucky legislature the wham, bam, thank you, ma'am legislature. Um, and Republicans are just exceptional at it. Yep. I have no doubt, no doubt that previously Democrats have taken advantage of this redonkulous system that we have. Um, but now it's, it's, you know, it's a master class. It's an art form. On the very last day of the legislature prior to getting into the veto period, there were over a hundred bills passing back and forth between the House and the Senate in one day. That's insane. <laughs> I can't think of an appropriate right. word to even talk. Right. And so now, you know, you have some legislature, legislators on both sides, Democrats and Republicans, with buyer's remorse. Because all of a sudden they're realizing that they voted in favor of things that they never would have voted for had they read the bill. That's and why, it's because they didn't have time to freaking read it. That's why I, I was Ridiculous. noticing, I think uh, Attica Scott had said she had, yes. she had taken the position, if I don't have time to read it, it's a no vote. Right. And that should be an automatic from anybody. I don't care who you, I don't care if you're independent, Republican, Democrat, I don't care what you are. If you don't have time to read a bill, especially when you know the kind of shenanigans that goes down in the last 24, 48 hours, it should be an automatic no vote. If you can't read it, it's a no. If it's a good bill, they should want to talk about it. They should want to debate it. They should be proud of it exactly. instead of hiding it in the dark. Exactly. So that's just telling me it's a bad bill. Right. Or what was a good bill, and this happened a lot, what, what originally was a good bill or, you know, what have you, all of a sudden had last-minute crap attached to it. Damon Thayer. <laughs> Snake in the grass. <laughs> that, you know, just changed everything. So I'm going to run down this list here. And uh, kudos goes out to uh, Bruce Maples and Forward Kentucky because they do an excellent job of helping the, the rest of us in the general population uh, keep up Such with Such a great resource, it everyone. Is. It yeah. is. Check out Forward Kentucky. Um, and they help us, to, you know, stay on top of things. The other person the other group that's exceptional just really i should say person is naomi penner who's with together we will louisville who without her you know i don't know that we'd know what's going on on a daily basis 
Um, she's exceptional. And so MVP. Yeah, she's definitely an MVP. Um, so we need to make sure that everybody's aware of those resources as well to, to, to follow those. Um, you can find them on Facebook. Both have a public page to help you stay current on what's going on with the state legislators. So anyway, let's go down this list. Here's bills that have absolutely passed. Uh, Senate Bill 150 was the no permanent, no training, concealed carry bill. Yep. That uh, is has I think it's been signed into law. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, because the Sorry. the uh, NRA guy came to Kentucky yep. just to do a nice little photo op for Matt Bevan, and the big question on Twitter was who paid who. Yeah. You know, did the NRA contribute to Matt Bevan's reelection campaign in order to get that bill? passed or did Matt Bevan pay them so he would come in for a nice photo op for his re-election campaign the Probably. answer is yes <laughs> Look, and cro- we cro- all pay the payments the crossed end. in the mail <laughs> yeah. I think is what happened a little, little swinging Tax on both sides there so now that, um, that goes into effect uh, I think in July right yes yeah. then we have not one not two not three but four bills Against abortion. Four. Because that is so important. Yep. Right? We don't have anything else we need to be worrying about, like bringing in revenue to the state or, you know, fixing... Anything else? Fi- fixing our le- our infrastructure and what have you. Yep. We got to take the time to pass four bills on one thing. Not to mention bills that that have been ruled unconstitutional in other states that where they've been passed. Right. right. Every time. So it's going to cost our state right. resources. Right. People. Money. Right. Our tax dollars. Right. Uh, the next bill that's just should be criminal. SB7 is the forced arbitration bill, which allows mm-hmm. employers to force employees to agree to arbitration of all claims, including sexual harassment as a conduct of employment. I got to tell you right now, right now, any employer who puts that on the table, they can't pay me enough money to go work for them. Well, but here's the problem with that. All of the employers are going to put that on their, are going to put those in their agreements. They're all going to put them in. Because I heard an argument on the radio the other day where somebody's saying, well, when you read your employment agreement, if the employer wants to do that, just don't sign it and don't work there. Go work someplace else. But what happens is, Almost every employer will put that in their paperwork. So it'll be a choice of, sure, don't work. You can be homeless. Right. It's a slippery slope. Yeah, you won't have a choice. You'll have to accept that if you want to have a job. I don't know. I find it hard to believe that any ethical company would do this. That's a whole nother podcast in and of itself. Well, true. true, But (laughs) that's what it comes down to. I mean... Good companies treat their employees well. And the perfect example for that is Costco, right? They're not a good company. Good company. Great company. Pays their people a living wage, just gave them another raise, has tiny turnover in employment um, because of how well they treat their employees. A company like that is not going to do this. You know, they're going to feel so confident. They don't need to do it. That right. they don't need to do something like this. Yeah. On the other hand, Walmart and all of its subsidiaries mm-hmm. will definitely do this. So, anyway, moving on, because we're going to run out of time <laughs> before we get through the list. Um, let's see. SB8 was the bill that passed that changed the teacher tribunal. That was one that a lot of, well, all of the teachers were upset about. But if you put it in the grand scheme of things, of all of the bills that could affect our public schools and our public teachers that were on the table last year and this year that have basically been stopped in their tracks. Thank you, teachers. Yes. This is probably one of the smallest things. Right. This is one that changes the makeup of the tribunal. Correct. Okay. Correct. And instead of it removes a parent, a local parent, and replaces that parent with a labor lawyer. So the other thing that it does is it requires that the final decision Mm 
is an up or down vote. There's no um, ability for the tribunal to offer, to recommend any kind of intermediate steps like deal with mediation right. or... They can't defer it to another process. Correct. It has to be a decision. Correct. So, or there's no, well, if the teacher does X, Y, Z, then this. No, it's up or down. Um, I don't know. I So not the worst of the worst. It's not, it's not the worst of the worst because, in truth, I believe that this affects a limited number of teachers. Right. There's always going to okay. be a good one that, you know, that could get taken down this way. Right. But... I think that the percentage is very small compared to other bills that would affect a, a much bigger majority. Um, Senate, Senate Bill 250 went through. That was the uh, bill that changed uh, things specific to uh, Jefferson County Public Schools that allows their superintendent to choose their principal. Mm-hmm. Um, it also uh, changed some of the things on their site-based decision-making council, I believe. But again... That affects one school district only. Right. The bill that was trying to um, add an amendment that would have had the same thing apply to all schools throughout Kentucky, that bill passed only on the condition that that amendment was removed. So that amendment has been removed. So we don't have to worry about that this time. Okay. Next, you have HB 114 that passed. That's the anti-grams, uh, anti-grimes bill. Started out as a simple you know, bill about elections. But what happened was when Damon Thayer couldn't get SB 34 through, he basically took that bill in its entirety and attached it as an amendment to this bill. Um, and what it does is it strips the secretary of state of power. And it also changes the makeup of the board of elections. Here's the problem with that. First off, you have Republicans who aren't happy about this. This isn't just a partisan thing because you don't know who the next secretary of state is going to be. So let's play this out. Let's say that a, a Republican candidate wins this seat come November and takes over as secretary of state. If the supermajority come next winter during the general election or general assembly changes this and removes this, then it's definitive proof that it had nothing to do with the office itself or protecting anyone and everything to do with attacking Grimes. And and it, I'm sorry, I think that should be a crime. It's ridiculous. It's yeah. absolutely ridiculous. Well, and you're talking about, right, so Secretary of State is a constitutional office. Correct. Right. So the responsibilities of that office are constitutional. Correct. So if you're going to change the responsibilities of that office – that should be a change to the Constitution. You have to go through that process. Absolutely. Absolutely. And not only that, when you look at what the responsibilities of that office are, you know, their number one responsibility is as the chief elections officer across the state. So how absurd is it that they're not on the board? <laughs> right. Well, not only that, but restricted that person's access to the voting records. You know, you have all all these Republicans that are talking about purging vo- voter rolls. They can't do that if they don't have access. So you're hamstringing everyone across the board. What purpose does this serve other than to punish crimes in an election That's year what they're doing. in the state? That's absolutely what they're trying to do. And it's ridiculous. But... You know, on record right now, I would say the exact same thing if it were Democrats doing this to a Republican. Yep. I agree. I absolutely would. This absolutely. is just wrong across the board. Okay, moving on. Senate Bill 100, the anti-solar bill. That was just such crap at the last hour of the last day when it wasn't an urgency that it be passed. They could have gone back and reworked the bill. It promises were made, deals were made that they would go back and rework it to make it better and more fair. But instead, you know, the coal lobby wins again to take solar down a notch. It's 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 ridiculous. Yep. 
And then um, it's sad. It makes me sad. It 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 makes me sad too, especially because that's where the jobs are. The jobs are in the solar industry. They're not in the coal industry. What are what are these fools thinking? Right. It make it just makes no sense. They're thinking they're going to get a donation from the coal industry. Well, look at the big five lobbying groups in Kentucky. There's your answer right there. And um, the other one that passed HB forty six. <sighs> <laughs> the sigh now requires all public school buildings in Kentucky to have in God we trust displayed prominently somewhere in the bu- building I'm telling you right now I'm I'm the superintendent of a school district prominently is going to be over a commode somewhere <laughs> because that's crap yeah. you know that's dictating religion in a government building it's it's uh, it should be unconstitutional I hope that along with the many other ways that our Kentucky State Legislature keeps the ACLU yeah. busy and in fun- and fully funded, that this bill is one that they also tackle because I think it's ridiculous. Yeah, I think we'll see. A, I, I, I've got to believe we'll see a legal challenge to that, probably I, on I multiple think, fronts. I think we will. Okay. Anybody have any other big one? There's there's so much that we really could go on for an hour um, over all of them. What we can say is that after the veto period, there's one day left. Um, anything can happen in that day. And if you think that any group is sitting around twiddling their thumbs, not planning on being there, you are straight up cuckoo crazy (laughs) because you know we all know it doesn't matter if you're an environmental group it doesn't matter if you're a progressive group it doesn't matter if you're a teacher support group if you're for public education whatever it is especially if you're a public worker who's concerned about the pension because we all know went down last what went down last year We all know that anything crazy can happen on this last day. And it's convenient in a lot of ways because they've not done this in the last couple years that I've been following as closely as I have, that they did it this way. They took out days at the end. Typically, there's more than one day after the veto session so that the legislature, the legislators have time to see do we have the votes to override a certain veto or not um, or possibly pass a last-minute piece of legislation. I can't talk. Legislation. But. For the masses. You know, anything can happen that last day. Like Chris Toby said, you just, you never know. So everybody is going to be paying attention, whether they're in Frankfurt, whether they're watching on KET, listening on the radio, there's going to be a lot of people paying attention that final day, which, depending on what they decide to do, could spark heaven knows what kind of activity. You know, yep. we shall see. Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's going to be really interesting to see what happens that last day. And, I, you know, part of it obviously is going to depend on what the governor, what the governor vetoes and what the governor signs. Um, and uh That'll obviously prompt some of it, but uh, yeah, stay tuned. You definitely want to keep your eyes on Frankfurt for that final day, and um, and be aware of what's going on. You know, I'm sure we'll have some cow patties to pass right. out. Right. Well, and <laughs> you know, like we talk about all the time, and I've said I don't know how many times over the past couple of years, all politics is local. You know, we have people who are so wrapped up in what Trump's doing and the everything that's going on at the federal level, but they can't name who their state House representative is. They can't name who their state senator is. They can't tell you, you know, what their county fiscal court does. And we need to stop that. We need to get educated, involved, engaged on every level. And there is no office too small for somebody to run for. I don't care if it's school board. I don't care if it's dog catcher. Do we have elections for those anymore? We don't. (laughs) But you get my point. There's just too many people that don't know that and they don't pay attention to that and they automatically associate 
what happens on the federal level to what's going on at the state level. So, you know, if they're a Trump supporter, oh, they're going to support any Republican candidate at the state level or the county level or the city level and not pay attention to, you know, those integral details that matter about, you know, are they going to come fix your street that you've been promised for the last five years is going to be taken care of? Trump don't care. Are they on the board of a corporation? Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, Trump doesn't care about that. He doesn't know about that. He can't help you with that. Just like he's not helping our farmers or our workers, just like we're seeing plant after plant after plant close, despite his promises. And that's a story for another episode. (laughs) But you, you get my point. We have to be paying attention at every single level. We have to be involved. We have to be engaged. And we have to help spread the word. Yep. So coming out of the legislative session, we'll uh, be going right into primary season for uh, the constitutional offices here in Kentucky. So and there are quite a few candidates um, running for uh, running in the primary. And in our, I know in our next episode, we'll spend a little more time talking about that. We'll be past the uh, general assembly session. Uh, so we'll, de- we'll have a final few thoughts on that and then we'll talk about what's coming up in the primary and um, and who's running for what so you can look sounds exciting to yeah i can't wait <laughs> it's always exciting here in kentucky so that's going to wrap up our this episode of left in kentucky we thank you for joining us and make sure to tell your friends to listen to us and and check us out and if you have any comments for us make sure you leave those in the comments field no matter how you're uh, listening to our podcast we appreciate that we'd love to hear from you that's it for this week this is roberto enriquez amy ferguson and dickerson saying goodbye later later